I had an experience earlier this year, actually with mass, where we were doing some breathing. And uh, during this breathing, it was very heavy Wim Hof breathing. I blacked out and uh, I was completely out and my whole body was shaking and everyone around me said that I was making noises and I was doing stuff. And I felt like I had just taken a nap. And then after that, I woke up and I asked Wim Hof, he was there. So I asked him, I was like, what was that? And he said, that is trauma. And that's the way that the brain processes it. And that was the first time I was even introduced to the fact that trauma can be, you know, can be stored in your body like that. And I tried it and it's real. I mean, we've talked to Wim Hof, but he's, you know, he's not a psychi uh, psych psychiatrist like you are, a psychologist. So maybe you can explain what is it that happens when something like that goes on? Absolutely. And very thankfully, there's come clinicians now, my, myself being one of them, who continue to speak about an expanded definition of trauma and really beginning to apply the label to not just what happened, though more so to what is the impact of what happened. And if we can't in our physical bodies, again, in our physiological nervous systems, if we don't have the tools and the resources, if we don't have that grounded present, safe and secure caregiver to help our nervous system regulate through moments of consistent stress, of de developmental stress, of emotional experiences, then the impact, to speak to your very beautifully illustrated point, will live in our body. In particular, it will live in how our body adapts and even just tying this concept with disconnected. And because many of us didn't have the tools to be in our emotions, we do. We distract ourselves with endless achievement, with worrying about other people. Um, like me, I lived for many years in that shut down state of dissociation. I call it, I was away in my spaceship. And so for many of us, we're not even connected to our body enough to have those very beautifully illustrative moments where you're now doing this breathing exercise that is allowing your body to tap into and to express the trauma that lives beneath it. Though we are all, you know, even that distraction cycle, that disconnection cycle, that hypervigilance or caretaking of other people cycle is actually, when it comes down to it, a byproduct of our best attempt at protecting ourselves from those deep rooted emotions. So when we become conscious, I think of this and the reality that we do have that emotional energy and we have adapted in all of these ways, then we can begin to, as you beautifully did, build in intentional practices where we allow ourselves to become present to the trauma within our bodies and more so to tap into these really empowering practices, breath work being a predominant one that allows us to then release this emotional energy. The neurology behind that, is it something that can be explained? Is it something that we know? What is it that happens because... And I actually wanted to add it to, to, the, to that as well, uh, because I see it from a physical perspective a lot with my own practice, what I do. I see trauma stored in the muscles. I see trauma stored in the fascia. Um, but of course, it is always the byproduct of a mental activity or some emotional uh, uh, stimuli that occurs that stores in the physical body. But I'm also aware that it can be stored in the subconscious mind. And I guess that's how you mainly see it. So yeah, how, how, how do you see trauma? Why and how is it stored? Trauma is... is right? All of the dysfunctional, self-critical thoughts that run through our mind and the physiological impact of the beliefs that were created in our earliest environment. So it is the neurobiology very much like you're beautifully describing of our subconscious mind and even tying again all these concepts together. I've come to realize, and I just use myself as an example, how our physical body our posture, our musculature, right? The tension in our fascia muscles or our fascia, um, you know, fibers. That is, in my opinion, we almost become, right? A physical representation, our physical being that is of our subconscious mind. All of these neurobiological, emotional, mental patterns that in my opinion were born out of these earliest environments, the way our mind learned how to make sense of ourself, our place in the world, our place within our relationships, and the way our body adapted. And so I see in myself, and again, just continuing with that example, I have so much tension 
especially around my midsection um, in my fascia and my muscles from living in that state of freeze, that shutdown state dissociated away on my spaceship, like I was describing it, my body reflects that so much so in this kind of protective stance, I have a very hunched forward rolled shoulder um, protecting again my very vulnerable heart space, not having the safety and the security that I need it to be open, to be vulnerable, to be supported in these emotional moments. And so as I entered into my 30s, I mean, I became that embodiment, hunched over, tense, bracing, waiting for that next shoe to drop. And that was very much reflected in how I felt and the way I was manifesting or expressing in the world. So did you uh, approach uh, your trauma, uh, your trauma release from a physical perspective? Because it seems that you're pretty much aware of the posture thing and the breathing thing. So have you gone through these processes in order for for you to release your trauma that way? The most transformational piece of information that I, I gathered was that I needed to include the body in my conversation. Um, in my healing journey. And so I remained then committed from the moment I discovered how important the body was, how dysregulated my body was, how, I mean, even down to the nutrition that I was eating, how inflamed um, my body was just continuing, right, this stress response, how it was reflected in my posture, like I'm sharing. So I also knew how important it was to integrate these new practices into my daily habits for it to become my lifestyle, not just to right? Go to a breath work session, you know, once every couple months and then never worry about that again, or, you know, have a nice stretching practice and, you know, only do that erratically or inconsistently. So I was committed um, to building in slowly but surely those daily habits with me. It was a focus on my nutrition, um, removing all of the inflammatory foods that I was eating that I know was damaging my gut. I learned the importance of the gut brain connection and for me how damaged and porous my gut was continuing my body's inflammatory response. So small choices throughout my day to not eat inflammatory foods and to make sure that I was getting the actual nutri nutrients that I needed. And similarly, in terms of movement and stretching to release, begin to release all of those very tense muscles um, I really struggled to get a deep belly breath in because of my posture, because of my musculature tension. So while I knew breathing was really important, that for me had to go hand in hand with stretching and movement and releasing the tension. And then, of course, building in that daily habit of beginning to shift and get really intentional with the way that I was breathing to help use that as a regulatory tool. And I'm still, I mean, to this day, Every morning I remain committed um, before I go about my day and have all these wonderful opportunities to talk about all of this stuff. I need to have some time in my mornings and, of course, throughout my day in, in terms of the nutrition piece to make sure that I'm doing and keeping all of those promises so that my body could continue to release all of that trauma or that tension and so that I can be grounded and connected and present when I am giving these you know, conversations.